we were interested in trying to understand the issue of uh, uh, market power, how it relates to uh, data or information in the context of you know, large in internet platforms. So um, I think well, for this group, I don't need to motivate this. Uh, th there's, there's no uh, arguing that these large platforms have changed the way many market participants uh, interact. Um, there is also, uh, it's also obvious, in fact, it's uh, stated uh, from, the, from the inception of, uh, say, Amazon, for instance, that data gathering was uh, front and center in the business model. And um, so we are interested in, you know, what are the effects of uh, this uh, data collection on market participants? So that's a bit broad. Um, and so we are going to focus on like a subset of, of issues. So specifically, how does uh, data gathering have to affect the buyers and sellers? Is there a role for regulation uh, of the amount of data collected? And, and, and why are these new platforms different from uh, traditional retail stores? So, um, so the first thing about the data. So of course, they, you, you could have many different models of, of data. So just to be clear, we are not going to have anything to say about privacy. Or this is purely about uh, efficiency and market power. So we think of data as a way to uh, improve the quality of matches. That is offering the right product to the right people. And uh, that's the plus side. And the downside is going to be the market power of the platform vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the sellers. It could be buyers and sellers, but I think most of the talk we're going to be in the case where um, you know, one side of the market pays nothing and the other side pays everything. So the sellers, in fact, pay the fees. Um, so, so, the, so that that's all the trade-off with, uh, with respect to data. So we don't have people don't care about privacy. They don't value the risk of uh, leakage of information or private information. None, none of that. So it's a subset of the potential data issues. Um, and then for regulation, it's the same thing. We we just ask: Is there a point where the regulator thinks that? Um, the, the amount of uh, information collected at the platform increases the market power of the platform relative to the sellers too much to the point where uh, it would be efficient to limit uh, the collection of data or the market power if feasible. Um, and uh, in terms of the, uh, the welfare effect here, essentially all that happens in our model happens via the entry of sellers. So you could imagine other uh, ways where welfare would be affected, but in our model, it's going to be purely like an entry model. So all that happens is at some point, if the, if the platform has too much power, it's going to in increase the fees that it charges to the sellers. And um, uh, that's going to reduce their expected profit. That's going to reduce the entry of new sellers. And the consumer are going to be negatively affected because they're going to have fewer sellers to choose from. Again, I'm not saying that you know you could definitely imagine other ways in which welfare would move, but this in our model is just that. Um, and then uh, the last question: How do, you know what do we have to say about uh, these new platforms with the old ones? In our model, it's purely um, there is nothing qualitatively different between a, say Amazon and a large retail store, but the model is, is non-monotonic. So it happens that when uh, information gathering capacity is small, then improvement in this processing capacity tends to improve welfare because the efficiency gains from better matching is much larger than the potential market power issue. Um, but if you keep increasing information processing capacity, at some point, uh, the gains in matching efficiency uh, are, become small relative to, uh, I should say maybe, it depends on the parameters, but uh, may become small relative to the market power of the platform. So when, 
so I, I think maybe that may not be <clears throat> like a very bad description of, of reality because if you look at it in details of what the Amazon versus a standard retail store, it's not clear that there is an, anything Amazon does that is that hasn't been done before by uh, retail stores. Having your own brand, looking at what your consumers buy, using consumer information to put your product on the shelf in the right place. All of that has happened for 200 years. Um, so in the model, it's true as well. And the only thing that happens is uh, it's really the size and efficiency of Amazon that can get, can get you in the parameter space where further improvement of, 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 of data gathering could potentially reduce welfare. So it's more like a quote unquote quantitative difference. Um, compared to um, the existing, well, so I guess maybe if you have 40 minutes, I'm gonna be quick here because I also want to have that discussion with you guys at the end, um, try to figure out, you know, what's the best way to compare what to do with what has been done. Of course, I mean, we know the classic, uh, you know, from Kat Shapiro to uh, uh, Rocher Tirol. Um, so I think one way to think about the difference is we come from a more macro perspective. And so in macro models, the benchmark for search and matching is constant return to scale. And, um, and so you know, in a standard model, we think about people matching uh, randomly or, or directed. Um, and um, once you have a constant return to scale matching function, you have network effects, but you have congestion effects and they tend to balance on average so that it's not obvious that uh, the outcome is inefficient. Um, while many of the papers we've seen in the literature, uh, they tend to have this super strong inclusion return to scale where essentially there is no congestion effect. So like the welfare of the buyer is proportional to the welfare, to the number of sellers with no impact of having a lot of million uh, buyers. And, uh, and, and then of course in that world, uh, things are typically inefficient to, to start with. So we're going to do the opposite. We're going to start in a world where things are typically efficient and then try to understand uh, how the market power could bias the results. Um, but I, I, on the other hand, I, I, know, I don't want to claim that this is uh, like the best model or this is, it's just, I think it depends maybe on the application. Um, on the retail platform, uh, I, it still seems to me that constant return is, seems like a pretty reasonable uh, approximation, but uh, in the matching function, of course. In the setting of the platform, you could have fixed costs, obviously. But, um, um, but, uh, but if you think about credit cards, maybe it's less obvious. You know, so I think it depends a bit on the platform you're modeling. But that's going to be important, I think, for for, for the result. It does, yeah. Um, but I think in the interest of time, it's better if we have that discussion at the end. Okay, so the model is uh, quite simple. You have buyers and sellers. And then we're gonna have um, a place where they meet. And so we want to think about the platform, the new platform competing with the old, say brick and mortar um, retailer. So let's describe first the world pre-Amazon and then we describe the world with Amazon, right? So pre-Amazon, there, there are buyers and sellers. So these guys are not going to change. And then there is a place where they can meet we call that the, uh, so we're gonna call it the outside market. It's gonna remain there. Um, and um, in the outside market, there's also some data that buyers and sellers can exchange to figure out who, uh, what kind of goods people want to buy. So the data for us is, well, that's exactly straight from uh, Shota's paper. So we're gonna do our discussion. So we literally lifted that from, uh, from his uh, ER paper. So people have different tastes. So there is a big, big uh, capital I number of goods they could buy from. They don't know which one is good. And then you, you get a signal that tells you something about the one that's likely to be the right one for you. Um, so the signal has a realization sigma and a precision delta. Um, so that information is gonna improve the matching. The matching itself, it's a standard uh, competitive search uh, framework. So if, uh, just to, to make it uh, formally, uh, there is a mass N bar B of buyers. So notice here, uh, and I think for most of the talk, uh, we're gonna take the number of buyers as given. It is actually an assumption, like it, I think something could change if we, if we change that. So right now we are working on bringing uh, buyers entry, but right now think of there's a pool of buyers that's fixed. 
So there's a mass of people who want to buy stuff. Um, and uh, they, they don't know their taste. So uh, they have a test UI across a bunch of varieties of the same good um, with big I is the number. And uh, the best one out of this pool gives them utility U and all the other ones give them zero. So the name of the game is to figure out the white trying to buy. But to do that, there's a signal. Um, sigma realized on the same space. Okay. And um, the precision, so the probability that the signals give you the right outcome is delta. So the probability that the signal sigma points towards good I, condition the fact that good I is indeed the one that is good for you, that's delta. And uh, we start with uniform distributions. Uh, so the, your priors across all these guys is uniform. So delta is also going to be the, uh, you know, exposed probability of, of uh, making the right choice. So delta could be anything. So uh, between, so of course, one over i, that would be uninformative, and then some upper bound delta bar. So we, we, we have two versions of the model, one in which people can choose uh, delta at some cost. Um, so that could be, you know, act either, uh, so in the old days, it would be filling in the forms that people ask to about your taste or some feedback. Today it would be like accepting cookies. Um, and that, that there's a cost for you of doing that. Um, and then there is a technological upper bound delta bar. So that's the maximum amount of data or the maximum precision of the signal. Um, I think for most of the talk, we're going to forget about the private cost and just have the technological upper bound. And then we can discuss what what it changes later, it doesn't change much. Um, okay, so the sellers on the other side of the room are like, these are the buyers. So the buyers, they have uncertainty about their taste, but they can disclose information to the buyers. So formally they disclose information to the buyers to guide so that the buyer can offer them the right good. Um, then, so to the sellers so that the sellers can offer them the, the right good. The sellers, uh, they are pretty simple. They are uh, they sell one unit of, uh, of good in the outside market. They have an entry cost kappa. Um, and then there's directed, uh, they, uh, they get the consumer data. They see the disclosure choice and the signal. Then condition the signal, of course, they're gonna choose to offer the good that is the one corresponding to the signal. Um, and then the probability that this is the right good is delta. That's because we start from a, we start from a uniform. So therefore, if delta is the conditional that way, then by base law is also the conditional the other way. So delta turns out to be also the probability to make the correct, that your choice is correct conditional on the signal. Um, and then we have completed search. So I mean, maybe it's, um, yeah, okay. So, uh, in the outside market, we're going to have a, a, a mass N bar O of legacy sellers who are always there. This doesn't matter here. It, it will become convenient after when we have the platform as well. So there's always some buyers. So if, in other words, this entry cost is for the new sellers who might uh, decide to enter, but there is some legacy sellers who are on the outside market uh, always. And the matching technology uh, is content return to scale with uh, power gamma one minus gamma on uh, sellers, on buyers and sellers. So as usual in this case, uh, the, the matching can be summarized with uh, tension in the market. So the ratio of seller to buyers. So little n is the ratio of sellers to buyers. It's like uh, if I can see to an employment ratio in the search model. So N is the seller, number of sellers relative to the number of buyers. So then the probability that the buyer meets the seller is, it depends on the matching efficiency, alpha bar. So that's just a technology parameter and O for the outside market. N to the one minus gamma where N is the tension. So if N goes up, there are more buyers per seller then each seller is more likely to meet uh, a buyer. All right, so then uh, I think we are ready to solve for the first equilibrium. So uh, you have 
So it's like the standard competitive search, really. So the value for a seller is what? Well, there is the probability of um, getting a buyer. And then there is a priority of getting the right product and then the price that the buyer would pay. For, um, for the buyer, it's the same thing. Uh, you have the priority of meeting a seller and then you have the priority of the right product. And then you have the utility condition on trade, which is U, the utility of uh, getting the right good minus P, which is the price uh, that you pay, okay? So if you solve that uh, equilibrium, then you get the standard solution. So because we assume Cobb Douglas matching function, so uh, constant elasticity, the price uh, is gonna be just a Shang rule gamma one minus gamma. So one minus gamma times U, okay? So um, the buyers, if the, the sellers get one minus gamma of the, the surplus and the, uh, the buyers get the rest. Of course, in, in general, this would be the elasticity. So it doesn't have to be constant, but with Cobb Douglas, it's constant. Uh, then um, the number, then to solve, so that gives you the price. Once you have the price, you can get the value functions as a function of N, which is the tension in the market. The last thing you need to do is to solve for N. So that comes from, from free entry. Remember on the buyer side, it's, by, it's, it's simplified. So I don't have free entry of buyers. So this guy, the number of buyers is just a fixed number. So N is the ratio. So all I have to figure out is the, um, the numerator and S, number of sellers. And it's gonna be the exogenous part plus the number of entrants. And if, N, if the number of entrants is positive, then the, the free entry condition has to be satisfied. That just says that um, the value of the seller has to be equal to the entry cost. Then for that, you can solve for, for the tension N. Um, finally, you can, you can go back to, so that now that's the equilibrium conditional on a particular information gathering, uh, information um, sharing choice. Then you can go one step uh, before and say, given that the, buyers know they're gonna enter this market, what would be their choice of sharing information? Since here we, we assume no personal cost, uh, they will go to the corner and choose the maximum because each value function, uh, you, can just, you can see it right there. The value function of the buyer is trivially increasing in Delta. So they will go to the corner. If you wanted to introduce the, um, an entire solution, you would have to introduce a private cost of increasing Delta and then you get a, Entire solution, but that's not critical for what we do. So let's go, let's let them go to the corner, delta bar zero. Okay, so uh, then standard argument this actually claim is efficient, um, like all direct search with constant return to scale. Um, and then the market tightness uh, increases in delta. So delta is good, of course, it improves the quality of the match. Uh, it's going to bring in, therefore, with better matches, more value for sellers. So more sellers are going to come in. Now the sellers, are, since they break even, they don't really matter for welfare. But of course, the, the, the buyers are very happy because they see more and more sellers. So that increases both their priority of matches and, um, and their welfare. So that's the advantage of Delta. So now we're gonna bring a platform that's gonna compete with the outside market. So buyers are gonna have the choice to go uh, trade on the outside market, just like before or go to the platform. So the only difference you see for, from the outside market uh, is the technology is the same, but um, out of the buyers, there is a mass N bar B of buyers. Of course, they, in, the, in what we've described so far, by, def, by definition, all of them have to go to the outside market because that's the only thing. Now they're gonna have to split between the platform and the outside market. So there's gonna be an indifference condition that says they have to be indifferent to go on the platform on the outside market. And on the seller side, um, I still have my legacy seller stuck in there. So that thing is not going to disappear. Okay, that's where the, the legacy sellers are useful. Um, if you don't have that, you need to bring in some kind of equation return somewhere. So 
um, the outside market is still going to have some of the legacy sellers, but the new sellers, just like the buyer, they're going to choose, do I want to trade here or do I want to trade here? So for the platform, for the outside market equilibrium, it's the same as before, except that now the number of uh, buyers and sellers is going to be reduced and is going to be solved in equilibrium. So the buyers decide uh, where to search and they have the same technology uh, with the platform as they had with the outside market. So they can share the information. The key difference is we're gonna assume, and that's the big assumption. In fact, that's the definition of the platform. We're gonna assume that the amount of disclosure or the quality of the signals that can flow through the platform is higher than on the outside market. So if you remember on the outside market, we had this uh, technological upper bound here. Well, we're gonna assume that this upper bound on the platform is higher or potentially much higher than on the outside market. Uh, and the sellers, same thing, they're gonna be in different. The new sellers entering, they have to choose, they're, they're gonna go where they prefer. Um, as it turns out, the equilibrium is gonna be um, such that the buyers in different condition is gonna hold. So buyers are gonna choose where to go. And the, the sellers, if the platform is active, um, all the new sellers are going to go to the platform and the outside market is going to be only the uh, legacy sellers. Um, okay, so on the seller side, they uh, same technology as before, so they can sell their unit of good on the platform or on the outside market. They still have an entry cost kappa. They still get consumer data. The difference is on the platform, they can get better data, but they have to pay for it. So there's a price M, which is the markup or the margin of the platform. And that's gonna be determined uh, by bargaining between the seller and the platform. And I'll, I'll talk about that uh, in, in one slide. In the outside market, they get the data directly from the buyers. And then the rest is the same. So for instance, on the platform, they're gonna get a um, signal delta, and then they're gonna produce the correct variety with priority delta on the outside market, just as before with delta bar O. And the buyers and the sellers interact in competitive search markets. The platform and the outside markets are formally uh, the same in, in that sense. So everything that's on the platform is, is indexed without the O. So for instance, uh, let's look at the, uh, the priority that uh, the buyer meets the seller, it's alpha n to the one minus gamma. It's the same as before. Um, I just don't put the O index for the, when the platform is alpha bar in the outside market is alpha bar O. And same thing with delta. So delta bar now is the uh, um, technological limit for the platform. Okay, so the first question is, when is the platform active? And that actually is very simple and bang bang. And that's because everything here is pure uh, constant return to scale. So either um, the platform is more efficient or it's not, and that determines whether it's active or not. So alpha bar is the matching efficiency of the platform and delta bar is the information. What matters is the product alpha delta. So if alpha delta of the platform is better than the platform market, the platform is active, otherwise it's not. If the platform is active, then the buyers have to be indifferent between the two places to buy their stuff. But all the new sellers are gonna enter on the platform. And okay, so then to well, solve with the, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, regarding the, the previous slide. Uh, so you rule out the case where uh, the platform is better for buyers so that all the buyers go to the, to the platform. No, no, I don't rule out, it's just, it's not an equilibrium because uh, um, there is always some legacy sellers here. And so if you're the only, if you're the only buyer uh, in a market with uh, a non-zero mass of seller, the tension in that market is infinitely in your favor, you're mm -hmm. still gonna go, you're still gonna go. It could be that the thing that's, it's, it's, if you prefer it's continuous. So what happens if the platform gets better is the number of buyers going there it's gonna get smaller and smaller and smaller, but it's not technically zero. It would be, um, 
but again, that's to, to get that, I assume that there is a number, a finite number of legacy sellers in brick and mortar who are stuck there. So these guys value function is not going to look pretty. Like they're going to lose so because they have fewer buyers and but they, they, are, they wouldn't enter if they had no, but there they are, they are stuck. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, oh yeah, so then to solve this pretty straightforward, you go you do the usual backward uh, induction. So remember we have competitive, competitive search conditional on all information technology. We have competitive search between buyers and sellers on uh, the platform uh, and on the outside market. We have the indifferent condition of the buyers. Then we can solve for the tightness and the equilibrium. Um, then we can compute the value functions. And then we can look at the key decision for us, key decisions for us. And these decisions are the entry decisions of the sellers. And that's going to depend on how much the platform is going to charge. So it's jointly the entry of the sellers and the bargaining between the seller and the platform on how much the platform is going to charge. The other decisions is the disclosure choice, which again here, I'm just going to assume away all the private costs. So they're going to, the consumers, self privately consumers are always going to go for the higher possible delta. Um, okay, so I guess, so the value functions then not surprisingly, once you know the tightness of a market, it's fully characterized. So conditional on tightness. So that's a number of sellers relative to buyers on the particular uh, platform. Then you can solve for the value function. Same cup de glass, therefore same constant price. So in particular, in this model, by the way, the price of the good uh, is the same on, the, on, on both platforms. It's always uh, one minus gamma times u. So that the, the relative price is not going to change. It's not like the platform gets more efficient and then you, buy, you get the goods for more expensive or whatever. That's not, the, the price of the goods is, if you looked at the data in this model, the price of the good would be exactly the same. The only thing that would change is the, is the tightness of the market. Um, that's from Cobb de Glass, huh? otherwise, it would, otherwise it would be a potential change. Um, okay, so then you get the value function of function of tightness and it has the bargaining, um, the competitive search bargaining. So the gamma one minus gamma, it has the information efficiency delta and you see delta and alpha so information efficiency and matching efficiency, they always matter as a product because the product of meeting somebody and offering the right good. So it's always, they come together, which is why all the result for say entry of the platform depends on Delta alpha multiplied together. And U is the, that's the gains from trade. Okay, so all the standard stuff. So it's gains from trade weighted by elasticity and tension in both cases. All right, so now we have the value function for the, so the seller, that's what they get, okay? Um, but to get that on the platform, they need to access the platform and there's a price M for that. Now, we, in the paper, we look at two cases. We look at the platform as a, uh, as a, as a monopoly, maximizing the total revenue. And we look at bargaining one by one platform with sellers. Um, I think the private, the right, model depends on the application. So here I'm just going to show you the Nash. Um, the monopoly has, it's very similar with one extra term. So, in so if you do the Nash bargaining, then um, you have the value for the platform, which is how much they get right to the outside option. So this is if they don't agree with that particular seller. And then the seller um, pays the fee to the platform. And of course, all the action in the model comes from this which is the outside option of the seller is to go to the outside market. You always have the option. If you don't want to sell on the platform, you just say, fine. And then you go sell to the buyers on the outside market. So this outside option is critical because that's the one that affects the, de facto it's like affecting the bargaining outcome for the, for the seller. Um, the outside option for the platform, uh, we consider two cases, either we kill it, the platform, either, the only thing you can do is just is to uh, be a platform. Um, if you want to to use the um, the technology to create your own brand, then you can let the platform copycat the the goods produced by the sellers. 
And uh, if the seller doesn't accept the terms offered by the, by the platform, the platform will say, oh, fine, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just do a copy of your good and sell it myself. Um, and uh, so that we call that the copycat uh, technology. And the platform is not as efficient ex ante as the seller are doing it, but it can. So it, it become a, in this model, it, it could become a good threat point for the platform. Um, so given the other option, you get the Nash bargaining solution, which determine the fee. And of course, as the key thing here is, if the outside option of the seller is lousy, the price is gonna be higher. Um, so the outside option of the platform, so that's just describing the copycat technology. So just saying that um, they can create the same good, uh, but they have, a, they have a cost C. So it would not be efficient for the platform to do that, but they can as a threat. Um, okay, and then the second one is the seller, and that we've seen, that's the key one. The seller is the value function if the seller goes on the outside market. And the key thing that happens in the model is that this is typically decreasing in delta. It is decreasing in delta because um, if the, when the platform gets more efficient, more and more buyers go to the platform. The value of being on the outside market goes down and down and down. That's the main effect. If delta is, is if the delta of the problem is, is high, all the buyers are going to flock to the platform. That's going to depress the value of everything else. And that value is the outside option of the seller. So that's going to depress the value of the seller. And for lack of a better name, we call that the, get, the gatekeeper effect, which is if the platform is strong enough that it attracts most of the buyers, then there aren't, there are too, there aren't enough buyers left outside the platform to make trading outside attractive. That depresses the, the outside uh, option, the outside option of the seller, and then allows the platform to charge a high price. Um, Sorry, okay, so then, yeah. Let me ask a, another question. Uh, so I, I may not understand the, the bargaining. So here, it seems like you're assuming that the platform is bargaining with all the sellers at once. Is that no, right? No, 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 not. No, that's, what, that's the part I don't like about Nash. This Nash is assuming that they're buying in with one seller. But then in that case, shouldn't the platform's outside option be its profit if, uh, one, if it has one fewer seller? On it. Yes, that's that's what this VM is because it's like you would you would. Uh, but, but you, you wrote sorry. VM is equal to zero or uh, or something. So, so yeah. So yeah. if 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 that seller doesn't come to your platform, you mm -hmm. could you could uh, steal the idea and and become a seller yourself. That's that's what we write as the old seller. So. Okay. But I, I, I would have I would have assumed that if uh, one seller doesn't come, then you just are you are left with n minus one seller. It, suppose you cannot. Yes, yes, I agree. No, no, yes, that's another way of of, of writing it. Um, okay. Then so, it would be, but that, that would be independent of what you of the deal you strike with that seller. If the number of seller is good. So, but the the, the key thing though, the, the I we can get rid of that outside option. The thing that is important though is. Right, written like that is the what, the what I don't like about this is the platform is talking to one seller and then you solve for that thing as one seller and you don't uh, it's you don't take into account the fact that if you change your term you might attract a bigger mass of buyer or bigger mass of seller and uh, therefore you know you, you might have a you might try not to price too high because you want to high volume on, on your a higher number of sellers because that's going to attract buyers and more, when more buyers, it's easier to attract the next seller. Mm. And, and that we solve as the pure monopoly where the platform maximizes total revenues M times N S. And then it takes all of that into account as, as two polar cases. We just wanted to have the two polar cases. And uh, I, I think, I mean, I, this one is slightly simpler to write. There's one fewer term. Um, Everything I'm going to show you is there. It's just in the in the monopoly case, there's one extra term. Maybe I can point it out when we get there. 
Um, uh, yeah, so now if you think about the impact of Delta on the, on the seller's value on the platform, Vs minus M, which is the thing that's going to determine the entry condition. You, you have the usual term, which is if Delta is higher, there's more efficiency. So that's you know, much efficiency gains from trade, standard stuff. That's going to capture, that's going to be captured by this. It's weighted by one minus theta because now the part of the gains is captured by the platform. And then here you have the market power effect, which is um, the uh, impact of Delta on the outside option, either of the platform or of the seller. And this is the part that can create the negative welfare effect. So better, higher delta, higher match efficiency. That's great. That's going to, not only is going to make the existing matches more efficient, it's going to encourage seller entry, um, but it's going to increase the market power of the platform relative to the sellers. Um, okay, so then to solve, uh, maybe, yeah, I should try to go a bit fast. I think we've seen all the conditions. So the free entry condition as before, except that now you, you net out the, the fee. And then uh, the, the, the consumer in different conditions says that the consumer can always go to uh, the outside market or the platform. They're gonna be different in equilibrium. That's gonna pin down the market tightness. Um, I don't think I need to show you. We can find sufficient condition for uh, a necessary condition for uh, the negative effect to dominate, but maybe I can just show you, I think. Let me show you on the figure, it's gonna be easier. Uh, you have five minutes. Yeah, yeah, that's why I think the figure is nicer. Then I think for, for to, to plot the figure, I'm, I just, there's one more thing I need to, it's more like a, that's not fundamental to the paper, but it's just, it makes it easier to describe the figure. So we're gonna think about, because now we're gonna think about, uh, you know, in which space are we? And so I think at least for me, the, the, the simpler way to think about it is there is some underlying technological progress in society, which has to do with computer and IT and stuff like that. So let's call that X, okay? And think of that as exogenous productivity growth in, in technology. Um, and then there is the extent to which existing uh, retailers or platforms can use that technology. And that's the upper bound, uh, delta. So that's the, the, the quality of information that you can extract. Um, and so on the outside market, all we do is this delta or delta bar that used to be some exogenous number. Now we're gonna think of it as a function of X. And same thing for the platform. And when we say that the platform is better at using IT, formally what we mean is it's steeper. Delta of X is steeper than Delta O of X. So um, there, is, uh, there is a point at which the, uh, when technology keeps improving, it has a bigger impact on the platform than on the outside market. So that's, I think is that's the key uh, definition, right? Like Amazon could have been created in the 1980s but relatively speaking, you would have not, given the technology at the time, pre-internet, it would not have been more efficient at gathering information than Walmart. But post-internet, it's reversed. Um, and so that's, all, that's what we're writing here. Now, we could, you, could, uh, you could renormalize and write one delta as a function of the other delta, and that's fine. Uh, it's just, I think that, that way is the most intuitive. So think of it as, because now we're gonna do some kind of uh, comparative statics where thinking what happens if we improve technology? If you improve technology, then everything is going to get all the matching is going to get get better. But the potential efficiency of the platform is going to rise faster than the potential efficiency on the outside market. Um, I think well, the the welfare stuff. I think I explained where it's coming from. So we have some proposition that says when is it that uh, there is too much uh, information disclosure? But again, you, you know, the key idea is it happens when the uh, an imp further improvement on, of the platform depresses the outside option of the seller so much that the platform can reap all the gains and more uh, from, from, from the trade. And so this is, so this is how it ends up looking. I think that's a better summary of everything. Um, okay, so we have, I think most of the variables of interest here. Um, and now, so here on the, 
on this axis, I put uh, I put X, right? The, the level of technology. And then here, I'm, I'm showing you what I mean by um, efficiency gains. So the delta of the platform is in blue, the delta of the outside market is in red. Okay. So this is the you know, extreme case where the, the delta of, so initially, if you have better technology, um, if you have initially the outside market is more efficient, but it, does, it cannot leverage uh, the new technology as much. So at some point, the platform becomes more efficient at, at using the information. The point where they cross here is X hat. So there's some level. So I think about the, the past 30 years then that we were in this region and we had uh, in that region, the outside market was more efficient. So in fact, Amazon did not exist. And then at some point we crossed this threshold and the platforms become more efficient than the outside market and the platform enters. Now the outside market does not disappear because there's a legacy seller in the outside market. Um, okay, so that's kind of the comparative statistics I have in mind. Then we can plot the number of, uh, well, let's do this one is easier. The, this is the number of buyers in the outside market. So of course, when you're below X hat, by definition, the buyers have only one place to go. So they all go to Walmart. So, and it's normalized to one. So this is one, 100%. Then when we cross that threshold, the platform enters. Now remember here, because everything is constant return and there is no time to build or anything, um, it's a discrete jump. And immediately the platform steals whatever, 80% of the market share. So the number of buyers on the outside market drops from 100 to 20. And that is kind of flat and even slightly increasing after. The number of buyers on the platform here is the opposite. The platform does not exist, so it's zero. And then it jumps up and then it's kind of flat and it even going down a little bit. So what's going on? Well. Here, that's entry of the platform. And then um, the number of sellers on the platform, of course, jumps up. The total number of sellers also jumps up. But then, so that's the, that's the big welfare improvement, or that's the, the big shift in, in market share. Now, of course, when that happens, so and that's welfare here. So welfare is continuous because when the platform enters at Exat, by definition, they are it's just exactly the same efficiency. So locally, there is no change in welfare. And then welfare keeps going up after if you keep increasing technology because the platform gets more efficient. And then over that region, uh, welfare still goes up with technology. After you, after you reach that point here, which so this is just a numerical iteration. So this point here could be further right or further left, of course, depending on which point you use. But the key is that welfare goes up initially. And at some point, so here it happens here, Further improvement in technology, while they do improve welfare, they do improve the match efficiency on the platform. The problem is they depress the outside option on the outside market so much that the, uh, the platform can extract most of the gains and therefore the sellers are discouraged and you can see the number of sellers uh, on the platform going down relatively steeply here. That's what drives down welfare in this example. Um, but the, the thing that I found striking is what seems to be uh, often happening is that the platform, like as soon as it enters and it achieves a significant market share, after that, the, for a while at least, the number of buyers and sellers on the platform remains kind of flat. And that's just the platform essentially using every extra uh, gain of efficiency to just increase its margin as opposed to uh, increasing seller entry. So I'm out of time. So I, I think that I think that summarizes everything. So thank you so much, and I look forward to the discussion. Okay, thank you, Thomas. Uh, the discussant is uh, Shota Ichiashi. Shota, you have five minutes. Sure. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, uh, thanks, uh, Thomas, for presentation. Uh, thank you also for having me as a discussant. So today we saw the problem of excessive information disclosure and uh, as one of the two sources, the gatekeeper effect. And for the discussion, I'm gonna discuss what this gatekeeper externality, gatekeeper effect precisely captures. 
uh, I'll try to claim some generality of this new effect and also raises a couple of questions for later discussions. So first, I'd like to think of the gatekeeper effect as a combination of two forces, uh, which correspond to the two choices consumers make uh, in the model. So first, consumers choose whether to join the platform or outside market. And then if they join the platform, they're going to choose how much information to disclose. And my first point in the discussion is that even if we fix the level of information disclosure, consumers' participation decision still imposes an externality on other consumers. For example, if many other consumers join the platform, the outside option of sellers in the outside market deteriorates and the platform exploits this lower outside option. Uh, as we saw today, this could discourage seller entry and hurt users on the platform. That's a negative effect across consumers about participation. But on top of this, the choice of Delta information disclosure interacts with this participation effect, which is my second point. If I can provide my data and platform can use it to increase the value of transaction for me, then I'm more willing to use a platform, uh, which makes the first participation, let me say first participation externality more relevant. So the interaction between the extensive margin decision, the participation, and the intensive margin decision, how much information to provide creates a gatekeeper effect. And this, this decomposition means that the similar force like gatekeeper effect can work for also other activities on a platform that users can take to increase the benefits from using the platform service. So we learned today that providing personal information can be such an activity. But the same intuition could work for other activities, like the, for example, the mere usage of the digital service. If I use some digital service a lot, it could increase the quality of the service, possibly because of data enabled learning like a smart speaker or learning by doing on my side with respect to the particular user interface. And this value enhancing activity can encourage more consumers to join the platform. Uh, it can decrease the market tightness as we saw in the, today's presentation. So I think in my, so my understanding is it may not be crucial whether the activity like providing information benefits sellers. Technically, so long as the activity benefits consumers or the increase the utility of joining the platform, the negative gatekeeper effect will be relevant and restricting this kind of activity may be beneficial for the social welfare. Uh, so what I wanna claim here, emphasize here is the generality of this gatekeeper effect. And now the last point, the paper shows this, that the amount of information disclosure can be socially excessive. So restricting data collection could help. And I think that part of the story here, this negative gatekeeper effect is also about a platform the holdup problem. Information disclosure could deter seller entry because the platform cannot help exploiting the low outside option of sellers and capturing most of the seller surplus through the uh, today presentation through the Nash bargain. And that's a problem because the entry cost is sunk when the platform and a seller bargain. So we may think of other solutions on top of the restriction of data collection to mitigate this holdup problem. It could be a, a contractual solution, like a platform committing to a fee M in advance. Maybe that's the, what Thomas meant as the other monopoly pricing formulation. Uh, so this idea basically asks how the timing of uh, committing to the fee or the split of, uh, split of surplus, uh, uh, how important the assumption is. Or maintaining the whatever Nash bargaining or the monopoly pricing, the platform may they be able to mitigate a holdup problem by making it easier for consumers and sellers to multi-home for the outside market and the platform. So this may mitigate a set, uh, uh, improve sellers outside option, uh, mitigate a holdup problem. So it might be interesting to think other potential solutions. And another related question is whether the, this uh, negative effect, negative gatekeeper effect can also hurt the platform's profit. If that's the case, we could ask how the platform may self-regulate to improve profit 
potentially restricting data collection or using other possible solutions. Now, I think overall the paper provides a novel and deep insights, so I really enjoyed reading it. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs>